A very welcome uh, to all of you regarding our session of uh, bone metastasis with regard to uh, cancer and all variations of cancer. Thanks for the invitation, and I think we will have an interesting hour to see to it what's coming out of that. Me, myself, I uh, just introduce myself. I'm uh, the chairman of the uh, European Umbrella Organization of Prostate Cancer, the Europo OMO. And additionally, I'm uh, the vice chairman of the German organization regarding of prostate cancer. Anyhow, whatever we have and whatever cancers we are facing, uh, bringing uh, metastasis uh, brings a drastically impact on the quality of life. We have carried out a few surveys on that, and uh, the majority of them said very clearly the diagnosis of uh, metastasis in cancer usually is leading to a decrease of 70% in quality of life. People are psychologically involved, and additionally, they have the fear that uh, their remaining lifespan is maximum three to four years, which is uh, a burden for them for the whole time. I think we will later on hear something uh, about patient uh, journeys, about patient stories, but I think as the first instance, and that is my pleasure, I like to introduce uh, my fellow panelists, and uh, we do it as usually from my side to there. So, Eugenia, if you shortly please introduce yourself, that would be nice, and then give over to the other ones. Thanks. Thanks a lot. My name is Eugenia Trigoso. I am a clinical nurse and uh, I work in oncology for several, several years. I am specialized in, in oncology and in bone marrow transplant. And uh, I am from Spain. And uh, I work also as, uh, at the university as an uh, assistant professor. And now is uh, my colleague Nicolina, who is going to talk about herself. Thank you. My name is Nicolina Dolek. I'm from Croatia. I work at the Department for Oncology of Clinical Hospital Center Rosiek. I've been an oncology nurse for 13 years. Very passionate about it. I'm also a representative and executive board member of European Oncology Nursing Society and very pleased to be here with colleagues. Hey, thank you. I'm André Deschamps. I'm a prostate cancer patient. I'm also a past president of Europa Homo and president of the Belgium Prostate Cancer Organization. Uh, I helped uh, together with my colleagues uh, in ESMO and was part of the group uh, who made this nice guide about bone cancer. So I want to start off um, by presenting why do we meet in this occasion to represent you this on guide, ESMO guide on bone health in cancer. So Eugenia, um, would you like to say what do you think we will achieve with this guide for our patients? Well, I think that is, this guide is very needed for all the patients that they, they, they got a, a diagnosis about impact any kind of cancer because all is the, the bone health is it's mandatory to take care of this in each kind of cancer, in each diagnosis. Patients have to know what happens with their day by day life, and they have to know about this guide. They need that. I think that patients don't need to Google their symptoms and know what happened. They need to get the information for the physician, for the nurses, for all the team. Thank you very much for that. Uh... We all think that this guide is helpful for you all, so you, uh, don't miss the web page and see to it that you get it. Uh, there are a variety of cancers on it. One major point, and I only want to make a short introduction, and then I give it over to Andre because that is one of the points he also can do very straightforward, is um, the guide starts by looking at bone metastasis and how they are diagnosed. And the second point is, and that's, in my opinion, the point where the patient advocates and organizations are definitely in. Patients need to be informed about the symptoms. Patients need about to be informed about the ways uh, diagnosis can be done. And second, but that is uh, a necessary but not easy story, is how they actively can engage in that. Uh, because if you are once with the bones can diagnose by metastasis, you have them, and to get rid of them is nearly impossible. Andre, what have you additionally on that? Well, uh, you know that we did a, a UPROM study which was measuring the patient reported outcomes for the patient, especially in this case, 
prostate cancer, of course. And the basic outcomes is, yes, metas metastasis is affecting your quality of life very heavily. But what is even more important is that patients are not aware of what the effects will, will be. And I would encourage the medical world here to speak with the patients. This is what is going to happen to you, and this is all the help we can, we can give to you. Because we have seen in our study that it's not only the effects uh, that, that are there, but patients don't know what to do about it. So it's very important that we make sure that that is happening too. Thank you very much, Andre. Um, we think should follow uh, in a way that uh, the guide is offering ways of treatment in cancer are different ways and uh, bone metastasis are also different, definitely. But uh, it has to show, and it is doing that, uh, in my opinion, rather good, uh, how important it is uh, for patients to play an active part in the management and talk about their concerns before giving that to Nicolina, uh, who has much more details on that, uh, just one sentence on that. Uh, we on the prostate cancer side, but we are pretty sure the other cancer societies will be uh, running on the same way. We are absolutely favoring uh, shared decision making. It is over the time where an old and white coated medicine guy was sitting opposite and deciding what has to be done, and the patient was just listening. At the moment, if we have success, we only have success that they share their decision, that they make sure that the intention of the oncologist and the intention of the patients are the same. Otherwise, uh, the mis-success will automatically occur. Nicolina, it's up to you. Well, as a nurse, I can say that it's very important that patients have an active role in the treatment and in the decisions, because that first contact of a patient with a nurse or with a medical doctor, at that moment, you have to be aware, like a healthcare professional, that patients often don't hear, they fear hear first few sentences and they then just lose the information. So they need a written guide, they need something that will support them when they come home to their families, so they can think about ways of treatment that oncologists will provide to them as a specialist regarding some national guidelines. So they have to have a important role, they have to be in a center and be able to make decisions regarding their treatment. Right, Eugenia? Yes, uh, I, I agree that, that being, uh, for the patient it's very important, it's very, very important to work and to be aware that there are so many options. There are not only one option for the treatment. They have to have fair option and after, if, the, if sometime doesn't work, they have more options. They have always an option B for them. And also, to really, really, mm, they have uh, so many ways to manage the, the bone health. And that's something that they have, they have to know. They have to read about this and to get some, uh, some information for the bone health from the physician, for the nurses, for all the team that they are working with him. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, as a um, short story, uh, it is not just a one-way discussion here, so if anybody of you has any questions, raise your hand, bring it over. Uh, it's not a monologue what we are doing here. Uh, that's one thing uh, to state it here. And the second thing is uh, to take one uh, dream already out of that, and um, I underlined it here, to become bone metastasis free may often not be realistic. I think that's uh, the take-home message for a variety of patients uh, because uh, they come in with a dream that there is a certain pharmaceutical or treatment way and to get rid of that and to make sure that uh, they are leaving the office uh, with a plan to have a remarkable uh, reduction of the pain and they get a certain, uh, I would say, individually targeted uh, cure to make sure that this is workable. The next section of the guide, uh, they put it to me as usually because uh, we have the most story on that is uh, the bone loss accelerated stories by treatment. So we unfortunately have uh, to state and we do it uh, as a patient organization rather often that treatment, including treatment of uh, bone metastasis is leading to side effects and side effects can partly be cured and partly 
have to be accepted. The only point is some urologists are either didn't learn it or are not capable of learning it anymore or don't want to do that. Simple story, uh, it is uh, after a certain period of uh, hormone deprivation quite normal to develop osteoporosis. That's not a story of the general practitioner, that's a story of the urologist to be sure that if he is prescribing any therapy that's helping the cancer but has a side effect like uh, osteoporosis, he has to make sure whether biphosphonates or whatever is on the line to do it. So also in that case, uh, we deem it as necessary that the doctor informs the patient that certain procedures like DAXOSCAN or whatever is uh, necessary in the territory or the application of biphosphonates uh, are done. Nicolina, the next point is yours. Number yeah. eight. Again, from the nursing side, when you approach the dead patient and there are different ways of education and ways of intake of medication, so you have to be very clear to the patient, speak the plain language, because often they do not understand. Oh, I have to take a morning pill before any other, and I have to walk one hour after that. I'm not going to do that. Who will walk one hour? I have pain. I cannot do that. I have to take painkillers. Or if you are giving them an infusion, IV, you have to warn them that they can expect they have pain for a couple of days. What can I do regarding it? so they know what to expect, what side effects they need to, they can expect. Things that they are very, very important for all of our patients and is to know uh, how everything is in the day by day, day life, what they need to know about the nutrition, what they need to know about the exercise, because all these things is what is going to make uh, to improve the quality of life of our patient. That means it's not only to get the treatment, to get the, to get the chemotherapy. They have so many things that they need to know, and this guide can help them to know what they have to do about nutrition, what they have to know about the exercise. They don't have to rest 24 hours a day. They have to follow something like a most normal life and try to do exercise according to the need that they have. And that is something not only to take care of the pain or only to take care of the, of the pill that they have to, know, to eat every day. It's, all, it's also about to stop maybe or not alcohol consumption, it's, it's smoking, stop, and also exercise what kind of nutrition, independent nutrition for this patient at that moment. And that guy can help a lot and also can help them to make the question for the physician. What question I have to make for the next time for the physician, for the nurse, what I have to know. I think that's the most important thing that they, they need. Thank you. I want if Inserting a few minutes and uh, inserting Andre in that, uh, recapitulate one thing, um, side effects. And I take it specifically uh, prostate cancer where we are. If you go there and you have metastasis and you are going, which at the moment is unfortunately uh, the standard uh, practitioner, Dr. Google, you get about 54,000 replies uh, about the treatment of uh, metastasis. Within them, you get a variety of replies about the application of bisphosphonates. You get a very little story about what is necessary to make it beforehand. That means clearing your teeth and these things. And then comes, as usually, in very big letters um, that there's a 10% risk of jaw necrosis, which is a catastrophe, let's say, clearly. Andre. Well, the main message that I, 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 th I think uh, and I like to give to the, to, the, to the medical world is, first of all, do not underestimate uh, things. Yeah? There is still a tendency to minimize effects. Yeah? We are speaking about side effects. I think patients are not speaking about side effects, they speak about effects. And we all know that some treatments have effects. Well, just say to the patients, you will experience this, but we can help you. 
uh, you can help your, uh, yourself by doing this and this and this, and we can help you by doing this and this and this. So if from the beginning uh, a, a side effect is called an effect, and we can openly speak to the patients about it, the, te the, the patient will come forward much, much easier and speak about the problems that, that he has. Because now there is always a tendency, oh, I'm going to minimize it for, for my, myself too. So I think that's, that's a very important thing. We need to just have a change of, of mind to speak about those, uh, those things. Thanks a lot. Uh, it's actually underlining one thing, and um, we have seen it in a variety of uh, services in between. On one hand, you get a little bit of writing what is possible, and on the other hand, you get two, three, four shocking photos. And if you see once in the net that the jaw is more or less disappearing, that you get a kind of metal net uh, implemented, uh, and whatever is all behind. Uh, Nobody is looking there that it's only a fracture of the people's uh, where the application of bisphosphonate is done. Everybody thinks, oh Jesus, that is uh, my fate tomorrow, so why the hell should I do that? And we know in between people uh, from a certain stage onward are looking for excuses. Excuses uh, to do it and uh, that is one of the things uh, in what we say shared decision making, we have to see to it that we avoid it. We have a practical, actual basis at the moment, which has nothing to do with the guide, but just as a push-up. Uh, we know in between uh, that about 10% of all prostate cancer patients due to corona stop their treatment. That means they know they have a deadly disease, they know that they go into extended treatment, and they're afraid about corona and say, better uh, I die on prostate cancer and I'm avoiding corona just to see that patients uh, have a kind of psychological way into it and we have to see it how we work with that. It comes us to the point uh, a patient guide at uh, cancer plan uh, may be helpful to community of patients with bone metastasis. I think that Nicolina can say a lot of that. Yeah, I want to also point out that we can relate to this guide, a guide about pain management because it is very important to, it's related, two subjects are related. So we just want to point out there is already on the ESMO website also a guide for patients how can they manage those side effects and pain management that is not mentioned this but also perhaps Gunther can tell us something that how can patients be supported through patient associations. I'm in uh, this story long years uh, I'm diagnosed in uh, 2008 and successfully cured um, Andres also along with that uh, what we see at the moment, patient advocate groups have a variety of tasks. Yes, the first thing is that there was, a, I would say, the founding story of all of them to give psychological help. That was the one thing. Uh, the second thing is uh, nearly no urologist ever has undertaken any treatment by himself, so he can only talk theoretically. Patients who have already absolved that, who are behind the surgery, who are behind the radiotherapy, whatever, they can talk face to face what's in reality happening. And number three is uh, the possible side effects which are occurring. That could be sexuality, that could be incontinence, uh, that could be pain. Uh, much drastically better, in my opinion, explained uh, by somebody who has uh, suffered it instead of somebody who is sitting on the other side of the table and uh, is talking very theoretically what might come and how uh, hard it would be. That's the point where we think it's necessary. The second thing is, as a community, we should give the people something on hand, whether we do it by paper, whether we do it by leaflet, whether we do it by website, by Facebook, you name it. There are a lot of information centers at the moment, and the younger the people are, the more they are on uh, the cellular phone. We have to find ways to communicate to them what's possible, that's one thing, and the second thing is, uh, where we say there's a slight deviation between the doctor and the uh, patient advocates, we tell the truth. So it makes no sense as a patient organization uh, to tape there a blue sky where there is no blue sky. We tell them what's really happening, we tell them a Gleason score 10 is deadly, unfortunately it is, so we can only prolong life, and these kind of things. That's necessary. And number three is, and for this also a guide of that is helpful, Yes, we are engaging ourselves in political and in medical organizations are in favor of the patients. 
So that means uh, the respective circles are absolutely on the way to expect from us that we have a similar or same know-how. The only story is they have studied uh, usually 12 to 10 years uh, medicine, and most of us have a different way. Andre is engineer, I'm studying economist, so uh, it took quite some time to get the necessary basis. But with these guides like that, with guidelines, wherever we have a certain consensus, uh, we can push on the one side on a policy to make things. And number three, and uh, in our opinion, that's also important, before I, before I give it over to Eugenia on caregivers, uh, it is also necessary for us partly to talk to the pharma industry. Because uh, if you see the fantastic, what we say, uh, washing paper, uh, there is 90% from the lawyers, there's 5% from the medicine, and there's 5% advertising. Patients don't understand the word of that. They come to us, and if we see to it that these kind of things are repeatedly coming, yes, we are openly uh, going towards the farmer and tell them, please, uh, it makes no sense that our hotline is one plus cause when I should take the medicine because you are stupid enough to write it properly down. This we are doing as well. So, uh, it's a closed cycle where the patient advocates are at the moment running. Most important thing is they are independent. They are not influenced by policy, by medicine, by pharma, whatsoever. We do everything what we are doing, philanthropic on uh, behalf of the patients, make sure that they have something uh, better in their quality of life. And that's the point where we are on it. Virginia, I think you also have on 11 a bit more to talk. I think that there is it's, I, there are two things that I always do. We always forget in this kind of, 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 of problem. No? We always forget the caregivers. The caregivers that they are a very important yeah. part of the, all this. They are, it's not only the, the diagnosis and the treatment. We, as he said before, we always forget the, the side effect. That in fact is not side effect. It's the, is uh, sometimes are more debilitating than the, the real treatment. And the caregiver need to be aware of all these problems that the patient can have. That means they, they have to be aware, they can be vomits. They need to change uh, the way of life that they are doing till this moment. And they have to be aware of, of everything. So I, for that reason that I think this guide is very useful, not only for the patient, it's always for the for the, the family. It's not we are always thinking on the family, but the family includes the wife, so the, the husband, the son, that all the people that they have been taking care of, of our patient. No? For that reason that I think that they have to be uh, very practical uh, and very, very easy to follow for all of them because they need to give them the medication, of course, because sometimes our patients are not able to take care of himself and he needs someone that helps him. But also to think about the nutrition, to learn all the problems that our patients can have. And for that reason, I think that is a very important thing for patients and for the caregiver also. Agreed. Uh, I just pointed out that uh, a patient himself, uh, even if it's in a group, it's only reaching a certain target. No discussion. So the thing is, he needs assistance. Point is, and uh, I think there you already brought forward a point where uh, we are also strongly behind it. Uh, in cases of relations and in cases of cancer, I need a couple a caregiver and a patient who are closely working together, absolutely, no point. They have to find ways uh, how they make it, and usually, uh, if I reflect back to our way of working, and prostate cancer is a difficult story, uh, if a wife is not cooperating, it's very difficult, or if a caregiver, or if a nurse, or whoever is there running on the way, uh, she has to make certain things and make sure that uh, the decided treatment that uh, what we say, uh, the management of the journey of cancer is properly done. And uh, for that, uh, the patient is amateur. And the amateur never quickly gets all this medical background. He never gets quickly all these treatment options. So absolutely with you, no discussion. We have to see to it. 
Uh, in our organization, we do it very strong, strongly in between that certain things are done with a female, with a spouse, with a caregiver, that starts from the diagnosis of the cancer, where it is absolutely nonsense that uh, the wife is not with him because men, after three seconds, have a tunnel view. They don't listen to anything anymore. They hear cancer, they hear graveyard, they hear coffin, they hear dead within 12 months, and they don't listen anymore. So there, the first caregiver is necessary. The second thing is, partly doctors are ignoring pain. It takes a certain instance uh, until they do something, and nurses and caregivers are also there. In my opinion, a necessary uh, transmission to make sure that uh, there's a proper treatment uh, done. And last but not least, we all know that, uh, especially with the development of uh, bone metastasis in breast, in myeloma, in uh, prostate cancer, uh, the movability is going down. Well, what do you do without a caregiver? Die because uh, it's not always finally uh, the wheelchair, but we all know that uh, the backbone is very heavily involved many times. And if that is breaking, you need somebody to help you, you need somebody to wash you, to dress you, to make all these things necessary. So I'm absolutely behind that, no point. Good, uh, the glossary is Nicolina. Health literacy and um the design of the guide, we try to use, well, bone metastases do not have recognized color. So we try to kind of connect it with the pain. So we used red and blue colors and try to point out the key messages for the patients so it can be visible. As Gunther and we already said, but the patient has this first contact or his caregiver, he can remember all the informations he will be afraid to ask, he won't know how to ask, because perhaps not of the plain language. So we try to make the structure of the guidebook as uh, starting off with prevention, with the symptoms that might occur, ways that it could be diagnosed, but always um, making an impact that he should address his oncologist. Also possible ways of treatment and the patient associations they can contact and perhaps just Gunther can point out something about that health literacy and plain language in the guidebook? Sure, um, absolutely. Uh, from my side, and uh, you did already uh, the umbrella of that, I just wanted it, uh, two, three things, uh, which we from our side uh, strongly and very precisely criticize. Yes, medicine people are talking in Latin. Most people don't understand that. And it is a very difficult story, uh, especially as we get it as a patient organization. When the patient is coming to you and telling you, I had a doctor and they told me about a dorsal lesion, and what is that? Well, it is uh, strawberry pudding, it's the same. You have to tell them, please. First thing, I translate to you, no discussion. You have metastasis and that's at the left rear side. Second thing is, either you change your doctor or you tell your doctor he should change the language. Otherwise, no big story. A few things I'm with you, a doctor only can explain in certain stories, but this we have in the guide. So that's understandable for everybody in, but anything else that is done has to be, uh, in my opinion, uh, patient-related, in, in patient clarity, transferred forward. If that is not working, how should he cooperate? And uh, that is not only uh, at the moment related to metastasis, that is related from the pathological report, which is done after biopsy, uh, which is 95% Latin, and it's a fantastic story as a patient. Uh, you re can read that you have an asinary uh, prostate carcinoma, and uh, it has a certain level. As I said, the same as you can talk to patients about strawberry pudding, and that's the same uh, That's uh, what is uh, in it, and uh, what we are communicating is uh, anything that is not clearly written in the guide. If you face any problems, yes, there are patient organizations who translate that for you. They have hotlines, they have a variety of things available. But please, second thing is go to that guy, tell him uh, very nice that you studied uh, efficiently medicine, but talk to me, please, in an understandable language. Andre, same? 
Yeah, I think uh, use use the guide. It's good in, uh, information. So, also I would encourage the medical world to show it to the to, to the patients. Here you can find the correct in, uh, information. So, yeah, it's a it's a useful tool. I'm happy that it is there. So, uh, let's use it now. Okay, the design is also on the culina. Um, well, importance of this guide for the patients and the caregivers is huge. If anyone has anything to share, feel free to. Um, <clears throat> I have a question because the guidelines are very often made for the clinicians, which means that by default, patients will have difficulties to understand because they are not from the start made for them. The guideline on bone health you're talking about, is it a guideline for the clinicians or is it especially made for patients and carers? It's a specially made guideline for patients. So ESMO has a special series of guidelines on ESMO website for patients and a special section for clinicians just because of that issues. Eric, I've read it and I've worked on it. I can assure you this is under understandable for, for patients. Yeah. Well, it was actually the point behind it. Uh, I'm with you, we have one gap at the moment in Europe. We have six, seven, eight hundred pages of guidelines, usually S3, uh, in all languages, from the EAU for Europe, uh, from the German Association of Urology, to name one for Germany. Nobody easily understands them. First thing is the layout is not easy. Second thing is it's usually a compromise of 62 medically involved people. So a compromise is always a compromise. Number three is they all studied medicine, so there's a variety of things in it. And last point, which makes it difficult for patients, I know it myself because about 12 years ago, I also had to start there from zero scratch, is um, you have on the one side an, a recommendation. In case you have this and this value, do this and this and that. Then comes number two is, how it came to that recommendation, that is then written something between 75 and 100. Uh, that means in clear terms, 75% at least were in favor of it, which is nothing. It's an expert consensus. And there could be 100%, that means everybody was behind it. And then comes about four, five, six pages of evidence, uh, which is usually referring to studies and mostly involving uh, web links. If you go to the web links and you are no doctor, you are lost. So, What's necessary, we have uh, carried out the first uh, experiment in Germany, I think also the Benelux are on it. We have now patient-related guidelines. But number one is you must find somebody who pays that. Not so easy, because the urological society is not very much interested to make something for the patients, they make their guidelines. So we found Germany, German Cancer Aid, to make that. But there is a necessity for much more. And second thing is also to say that clearly, at the moment, uh, the cancer entities with um, a high incidence are, uh, yes, on the, on the limelight of that. So prostate cancer at the moment is incident number one in the world and in Europe, where breast cancer is on the female side. It's, thanks God, not the killer. The killer is the lung cancer, but it means uh, people are on that, they're looking on that, and uh, it is a bit much more easier then uh, to recruit funds for that to make sure that you get help as because somebody has to make it from the medical part to the patient related part then you have to print it or you have to bring it up to make sure you have to communicate it uh, that it goes into the people and that they know what to do it possible i wouldn't say never yes it is so only thing is if you come today with uh, what we say very rare diseases like pancreas or like bladder or a little bit lower like orphans you have nobody as a kind of backup. If you ask them for money, say, why? For what? And then additionally comes, which is not okay, it's not fair, but it is the case that uh, we have uh, quickly killing cancers and slowly killing cancers. So the people who are, or the females who are on the slowly one, are much more in the focus, are much more on the financial backup, are much more on that. Uh, in case of pancreas, I know it very deeply because I have a friend who is leading the German organization. Uh, after six months, 90% of their patients are dead. 
when they clear time, everybody says, why should I make for six months survival time? Uh, for these people, uh, a guideline that is uh, summarizing to 250,000 euro. And I print it, and hopefully next year I have a new therapy, and then I have to reprint it as well. So there are gaps, yes, but I'm pretty sure in the course of the next years, and Eric is on one of the important guideline committees, uh, there must come a point to make sure that patients get, uh, I would say, similar information to make sure uh, that they know what he's doing. Nicolina. Uh, the guide can also be useful uh, for clinical staff. It gives you advantage. We do repeat our patients, but they take it home, they read it, so they can find a proper question for you. They know what to ask, how to ask. Um, perhaps also as a reminder what is important for the patient to point out, to know, to find out. And perhaps Eugenia can tell more about the role of multidisciplinary team. I think that uh, what is important is that it's not uh, that have to help uh, not only the patient, the caregiver, but we have to think about also uh, all the people that is involved in the care of this patient. That thing is not they have the physiotherapists, they have the nutrition, they have so many people, and they have also this group that they are helping this patient, that they, this kind of group, the people that they are, when the patient sometimes they feel lost because they don't know anything about what can be happening with the future, and to know where, uh, where and when he has to make question. Who is going to answer this question? And that is something that is really, really important for them to have some group that can help the patient and the family. Uh, because I think that is not the care is not only a matter of one physician or only one nurse. It's a matter of a big group. They are all of them interested in the care of our patient. So the guide is for now available in English, but soon it will be translated to many other languages. And Gunther already said it is very useful because of the language barriers. You can download it on the ESMA website. Uh, you are free to make it, there's no point. Uh, Eric, I've seen you. Uh, one second on that. We have experience, and uh, Andre already explained it. Uh, the language barrier is uh, partly a disaster. So we have to see to it that we get it over, and the best example, and then I give it shortly to Andre, and then uh, the question of Eric, we have done it successfully with 90 languages, and we know what's coming out, and we know beforehand that only English is not the easy story, and that reflects finally to the same year. I think you can say a bit of, about uh, Eric, uh, Andre about the language well, barrier. Well, I think language is, a, is very important. We often uh, assume that everybody can read English, yeah, which is, of course, not the case. What we did with our study in prostate cancer, we translated it in 19 languages. Yeah? And it was not only translating it in the 19 languages, we have asked a company who is very able to do that to do it in a graph form. I know that not everything can be done in a graph form, but you, I was very surprised that the results of our study they could present in such a simple way. So that's maybe the way forward to think about it, because once you have a graph with a few words on it, the translation in another language is very simple. So I think we should use in, in the future graphics more, and we should use little filmy things more, so that translation in other languages is much more easy. Yeah. So that's the way forward f for, for the future. But again, I'm very happy that at least there's one in, in English, which... Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> You're right, Eric. A, a practical question, because we always speak about the uh, metastatic prostate cancer, I'm myself prostate cancer patient. And the question is, in fact, bone health. Do we have to wait until we have a metastasis to take care or to be... Um, thinking of bone health or is there something in lifestyle that should start eventually before that we get the metastasis uh, to protect us and the, because unfortunately some patients are diagnosed with metastatic cancer because we have no no screening yet 
which is an enormous problem. Well, you know, I think that's <laughs> your story. <laughs> I mean, uh, in, we have to focus a, a bit in, in, in very practical things and what the patient needs. They, they have to be very clear when and where he can make the question. And if we need to know something about nutrition, about exercise, about whatever, they have to know where to make the question and who can advise him about everything. That is, I think that's the most important thing that they have to know. About if you are a about, patient. About, the, about everything. Yeah. You will get advice by your oncologist when are you going to do your checkups. If you have any symptoms in between your checkups, which is described in this um, bone health in cancer guide, we have um, described the most common cancer types that have bone metastasis. Most of them do, but most common as a prostate and a breast cancer. So you will be led by your oncologist regarding regular checkups. And in case any symptoms, our recommendation here is do not suffer in silence. Make an appointment or call. I, the best option is your oncologist consultation. And he has to, of course, the patient can make the question to the, to the, the oncologist because it's in fact, it's his physician and who is going to answer all the questions that the patient needs, but also the multidisciplinary team, also this group can help also because there are so many questions that they, they are important for the day by day life, but they are not so relevant. And it, of course, every question is important for, the, for, for our patient, but sometimes there are so many questions that they can be answered by the multidisciplinary team, but the nurses who is in charge of the, of the patient, and it's easy for them to get this answer. Okay, thank you very much. Um, we have coming, thanks God, towards the end, but still have some things online. Um, the next two points, uh, that means um, the benefit and uh, how to reach us uh, will be on Nicolina, where I was impressed was that the key message is recognize the problem and do not suffer in silence. I mean, that is one of the headlines. Uh, we have to transform the patients to make sure that they are seeing uh, positively. So the great benefits of patients and the great benefits for uh, multidisciplinary teams and so on, Nicolina, it's yours. As I pointed out, um, all of the benefits and please download, if you already didn't, the guidebook, feel free to contact ESMO by email if you have any queries. So they are here for the patients, patient advocates, um, different associations. So we would really um, kindly ask you to disseminate this guide, probably also if you are able to uh, on your workplaces. So all the patients and healthcare providers are aware of the guide. If anybody else has any questions. Langa on Eugenia, uh, I think there also something on that topic. It's uh, every time the, the patient goes to the to the, the hospital or to the GP, whatever, they have to have access to this kind of guideline in order to know what they have to do since the beginning, not to, to uh, uh, wait into the, when they start having symptoms about all this. They have to have this in, in their hands since the beginning of the treatment. I think that was a question. Yes. Um, Nicolina, Eugenia, you were saying in this guideline you look also very much holistically on bone health. So are there also any tips and recommendations for on nutrition that you mentioned, on exercises, on the mental health being, as well as the other question which is wanted, probably bone health has also different stages um, because it could be like when it's lately diagnosed and what is then happening, will you also look at the staging? from the beginning to the end, and what there is also kind of tips for the caregivers. Um, so just wanted to, yeah, because I will definitely read it, but just wanted to, to be sure, um, yeah, if all these aspects um, are probably definitely in, but just wanted to be, yeah, to ask. 
Thank you. There is a small area with the photos and one chapter of the book dedicated to it. So, but as Eugenia said, as a multidisciplinary team, we did, we did not cover because we didn't have a nutritionist. So it also depends um, how oncologists ca calculate your body mass index and the therapy that patient is receiving. Is it chemotherapy, radiotherapy? So all of that has a different side effects and different effect of the body mass index. So each patient has to be um, especially approached. Um, it has to be a personal approach because you never know which part of the bone is affected. So oncologist is the one who knows that part, so he will um, connect you with the dietitian and also, for instance, on our department we have a physiotherapist. So, first of all, when we receive a um, patient with bone metastasis, it depends on the treatment because not all of the patients are allowed to move, to walk around freely, they have to get some prothetical help, so it, it is specialized um, regarding a special cancer center, so we didn't want to go so much inside because we cannot cover all those special areas in the guidebook. So the best is to address regarding what kind of treatment and what condition is the patient. Is he well regarding nutrition and how is his body mass index? And also, is it physical therapy approved? Is it recommended or is it not approved? Some of them also have to go undergo surgeries um, to improve the bone mass. So it is all um, kind of personal approach. But you have some associations listed for some countries, so you can look into it if it will be helpful. But the better approach is a personalized one, depends on the patient. Yes, because it's not only mm, because of the, the metastasis and the pain that they can do and everything, it's also uh, a matter of the bone loss that they, they need to have a special care of the nutrition, of the exercise, in order to be aware about And the patient has to know that they are going to happen. And they have to take care and to maybe to change the habitude that they have, but they have to change the way that they have to eat or the exercise that they have to do. They have a, a nurses a few minutes ago, they have been from the University of Turku, they have been making a very nice presentation about the exercise of the patient since the beginning to the end, since the diagnosis to the palliative care, because it's not that they are going to run in some marathon, but they need to exercise because they help to minimize the bone loss. Okay, we are, thanks God, good on the timeline. We're still online. Uh, okay, we have two more points which uh, Nicolina will bring, uh, which in, is important, yes, no discussion at all. This availability language and how languages can be translated and, and the future. And number two of that is uh, how you can access them, where they are, and how you can uh, work with them. I think that's your point. About languages and translations, um, also to point out if anyone can provide any support in translation, feel free to also contact us more by email. It, it will be very much appreciated and valuable, so it will be easier for us to, um, to approach and to disseminate that guidebook in different languages. So, thank you. Then we are through to it. That's usually the moderator's last word. Um, I appreciate very much that the audience was here and that uh, we got questions. Um, my opinion is important to see to it that uh, entity uh, based and entity overlapping. We have a guide now that is uh, covering the very difficult story of bone metastasis uh, in, in prostate, in myeloma, in uh, female breast, and we're pretty sure there will come thing more in future that's helpful for the nurses, the caregivers, uh, especially for us, for the patient organizations. They uh, we are very appreciating that. I thank you very much for your audience. Wish you all the best for the Congress, and thank you very much, and bye-bye. Thank you.